What we're here to talk about today is in part what the IIC with the Industrial Internet Consortium has done to actually develop uh, endpoint security best practices, which is a, um, a less technical form of how does one go about industrial or securing industrial devices. Um, the idea being is, is that that type of work is necessary. And ah, there we go. Come on back. All right, there we go. Okay, so um, it, just a real quick background on the IIC. The IIC was formed about uh, five years ago in an effort to bring all the manufacturers and tier two and tier three providers to the manufacturers together to start to tackle things like reference architecture and like security frameworks, um, test bed design and implementation, use cases. That's what the IIC does, and it's the, you know, many of uh, the organizations here have participated at one level or another in the IIC frameworks. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, Srinivas Kumar, the VP of Engineering, and myself at Mokana, and Steve Hanna at Infineon, who's the, the uh, chief evangelist for TPMs at Infineon, um, strapped on the first of the focus papers coming out of the IIC called Endpoint Security Best Practices. The idea behind that was the uh, IIRA, or the Industrial Internet Reference Architecture, is about 1,500 pages. The IISF, which is the Industrial Internet Security Framework that overlays the reference architecture, is uh, probably closing in on 2,000 now. So between those two documents, you've got several thousand pages of very technical documentation and diagrams to figure out how to secure or how to build and how to secure a reference architecture. Needless to say, not very many people sit down and do that. And then when you look at the basis for that, you've got another thousand pages of TCG spec on a TPM. You've got a uh, thousand pages of, of 62443 or 1500 pages of NIST documentation associated with how do we develop the artifacts associated with security infrastructure that we can convey a means to uh, an assessor or an auditor saying, yes, I've done the things necessary to secure my infrastructure. So that's a lot of reading. <laughs> and the, the reality is most people aren't gonna sit down and read that kind of documentation. So what we attempted to do was to provide a more concise mechanism for how do you get started in a program like this. And that's what the Endpoint Security Best Practices is all about. Um, it's important because it solves for uh, a number of the misconceptions that we have about what is an endpoint, right? We use the IEEE description of an endpoint, which is anything that has a computational capacity and a network capability. Doesn't mean that it's connected, just means that it has a network capability, has a communications capability. Um, we try to simplify a lot of the existing standards. So, you know, the difference between FISMA High and 62443 3 3 uh, SL4 is actually not very far apart. The control objectives are very similar, but the thousands of pages of, of documentation that you have to read in order to get to that conclusion isn't something that anybody's just going to strap on for fun on a weekend. Um, and then the lack of guidance around why should you do this? Right? I mean, why is an industrial security program necessary? Is it what we're doing good enough? Aren't our operational technology networks sufficiently isolated from threats that we should not have to worry about this stuff? And of course, the answer to that is patently no, which is why many of you are here this week. Um, this is designed specifically to interface with the supporting documentation, so you have uh, launchbacks and footnotes into the various contributing papers. Uh, believe it or not, uh, all three of us have read all of the documentation I referenced, uh, and yes, it takes longer than a weekend. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of information that is conveyed in those that is, that is replicated, and a lot of ambiguous use as to why you should do such a thing. I actually prefer the uh, IEC 62443 3-3 descriptions because they're based on threat, right? They're not based on conjecture. They're not based on a compliance objective. They make you start thinking about what is the threat to your environment, categorize and qualify the threat to your environment, then determine whether or not what you're trying to protect 
needs X level of protection against that threat. And if it's a, you know, it's a, a young hacker with minimal resources and minimal network connectivity, that's one set of, of threats. And if it's a near peer nation state with unlimited capabilities and espionage level uh, attacks that are you know, spanning multiple years in order to achieve an objective, um, that's a different kind of attack, and it's a different kind of, of threat, and therefore it's a different type of response that you need to have to that. And what we're trying to do is convey that in plain English, um, as well as Japanese. We uh, just yesterday got confirmation that we converted the uh, endpoint security best practices to native language Japanese. Um, so again, I've, I've pretty much already gone through all this. These are the, uh, the underlayments of the document itself. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, building out the, the various elements of the architecture on these bases, and then we footnote back to the actual individual control objectives associated with the relevant documents. When you read through it, there's lots of footnotes. Um, the idea here is, is that we're trying to empower the consumer via the manufacturer on how to build a consumable referenceable, defensible environment. Um, our, our targets are the owner operators from the operations perspective, the integrators that are responding to owner operators, RFIs, RFPs, RFQs, the manufacturers, many of whom are in this room, are actually the people that are developing the systems that are being integrated to meet customer requirements. And then ultimately, either government as consumer or government as watchdog to the public interest as another mechanism by which we have to take into consideration. Again, endpoint is just that. It's an endpoint. If it has a, compu a compute capability, it means it has a processor or some processing function. I don't care if that's microcode or if that's a, you know, an Intel i-series processor and everything in between. It's an endpoint. It has a computational capacity and capability. And then it has to be able to communicate that in some mechanism. If it's a sealed system and there is zero connectivity, then it does not meet the IEEE standard for endpoint description, and therefore it's not specifically covered by this document. Um, again, this can be everything from the device itself. It could be an actuator, it could be a gravitometer, it could be uh, an accelerometer. Um, it could be the control systems, which are, you know, digital or analog or combination thereof. Um, it can be, you know, digital and analog, something along the lines of heart. It can be everything in between, all the way up to and including IPv6 out to a cloud infrastructure running uh, a Docker or, or virtualization basis. Uh, and all things that are associated in between fall under the description of endpoints, switches, routers, firewalls, intrusion detection and prevention platforms, behavioral analytics platforms, user analytics platforms. All of those things fall into the description of an endpoint from an IEEE perspective and therefore are eligible in an industrial context for what we tried to put together in this document. All right, so endpoints require some level of analysis in order to be able to determine what is the threat. If the, if the threat is, again, if it's a, you know, um, um, a sealed network and the only threat is an insider threat, you know, is username password sufficient? Well, that would be 624433-3 level one. Maybe that's not good enough. Maybe you have outside contractors coming in and you actually want a digital identity. And in order to secure the digital identity, you need a root of trust on the platform. Is a software-based root of trust appropriate in that environment? Maybe. Unless, of course, the threat is capable of going up if you're talking about organized crime or you're talking about industrial espionage or sabotage. Those are the kinds of things where you need to take it up another step. That might be SL3, which requires a firmware-based route of trust. And again, this is directly equivalent to FISMA low, medium, and high. This is directly attributable to the guidance that the operations side of Industry 4.0 is talking about achieving. It's the exact same frameworks that the IISF has espoused as a function of an overlay to the reference architecture. So that's a lot of gobbledygook about, there's good reasons why you want to start with the threat. You know, the United States government actually takes a little different approach with FISMA. So they have a federal law that says you have to evaluate your application at three levels using three categories. 
It's called the CIA 3x3 matrix. It's threat level low, medium, and high, and it is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So in those three elements, in that 3x3 matrix, every United States government operated application has to be measured against a certain grid of law criteria. When you measure it, let's say that you know, your application is a, is, a, is a rarely used email system that's based on Gmail. So confidentiality is pretty low, availability is pretty low, integrity might be moderate because you're actually using a government Gmail system. That means that the application is listed as FISMA moderate. And you walk over to the 853 R4, soon to be R5, and you look down the row that says FISMA moderate. And all those control objectives in all of those categories, ranging from policy and implementation to execution and reporting, all sit within the 853 R4. So now you've got the rated application, and you have the control objectives that the government requires you to address. Now, and again, the government actually gives you a little more wiggle room in all that. In the fact that you have to address it, you can address it one of three ways. You can accept and demonstrate that you have the primary control objective as defined. Or, if you don't have the primary control objective, you can describe a compensating control. And the government auditor may or may not accept that that compensating control meets the primary objective. And then, if you don't have a primary or a compensating control, you can have what's called a POAM, a, a plan of actions and milestones, where you can actually build that capability over time with a very defined set of time references. And then there's a fourth category, <laughs> which is you don't care. You accept the risk as is. And the, risks, the risk officers are the digital um, cops that are inside each and every U.S. government organization that takes the responsibility for if something bad happens, it's on my plate. So if I accept the risk that I'm not going to have a firewall in place between me and the Internet, that's a risk that's pretty high that you're likely to get called on. And when the auditor comes by, the way the government does that is they take funds away. Right? GAO talks to OMB. OMB says, we'll just slash their budget 5% until they get it fixed. That's how the government works. Okay, so uh, depending on what level of application or what level of security is necessary to secure the application to include the platform is what we're talking about when we talk about how this snaps together. And again, the document does a pretty good idea or does a pretty good job of laying out the ideas about how you create that. And, and again, the document follows things like FISMA, the document follows things like uh, 853R4, the document follows things like 62443 in the fact that there is a lower level, there's a moderate level, and there is a high level of general security and security guidance that is designed to be applied to these elements. Um, and again, they're described here. So, um, quickly going into what those levels actually look like, these are taken right out of the control objectives. So when you're talking about an endpoint at SL2 or the equivalent FISMA low categorization, meaning the low category of the 853R4, the kinds of things that we need are device authentication. We need some level of PKI in order to enable that authentication or a comparable alternative to PKI. Um, separation of the agent, meaning that the, the services of the platform are separated from the services of another platform in such a way that it is not easily compromised by a pivot style attack. These are the basic things that you put into every platform that you build if you want to achieve those kinds of security elements against a compliance objective. And again, I'm not advocating for compliance, I'm advocating for security and security will get you compliance rather than building towards compliance. So again, these are the kinds of things that are capable of defending against low-level threats. Not near peer nation state, not organized crime, low-level threats. This is an appropriate level of security design to put into your products and your solutions in order to achieve that. And then you can generate artifacts that will support the claims of compliance at those various levels. Um, 
at the medium or moderate level, or 62443-3SL3, this is where we need to start thinking about a stronger root of trust, right? In, in the last model, we talked about a software-based root of trust. That could be a certificate in a protected store. That could be, uh, you know, an uncertified mechanism like a puff. Um, that could even be a key set, you know, something like EPID on a standalone mo model without using the uh, Intel enrollment process of SDO. But these are the kinds of things that you have to put together in order to achieve moderate is you need a stronger root of trust so that the measurements that you take from that root of trust have more validity because they are based on a stronger basis. And again, this is where we start adding in things like uh, how do we have access controls applied to each and every device? Again, this isn't network level security, this is device level security. That's what these objectives are all about. So the idea behind putting some level of access control into the platform to say, you know, 65,535 TCP IP ports, how many of those do I actually use? Let's turn off 65,530 of them and call it a day. And oh, by the way, let's turn on reporting so that if anybody attempts to use one of those ports, that we have knowledge of that. And it's reported and it's logged because something just went wrong. Right? These are the kinds of basic things that you can build into every platform that you do something other than hit the easy button on. Because at the end of the day, this is not easy. It can be made to be simple, but it is not easy to put these kinds of controls into the environment. And yet, in order to achieve the compliance objectives that government and industry are requiring of the end users, these are the kinds of things that we have to do in order to achieve those things. Um, and then, so now we're talking about PKI with certificates, right? Because we're talking about a firmware-based uh, root of trust that is going to be certificate-based and the PKI infrastructure is associated with those certificates. So what comes into aspect then is things like certificate management, right? So I've got my CA, I've got my, my online or my nearline or my offline certificate authority sitting in the back end. It's associated with a HSM or a MIM or even a SIM. I've got my firmware-based root of trust with a certificate in and out on the device, and one of those certificates goes bad, what do I do? So you have to bring in the aspect of how are you going to manage the device now that you have built it to meet those compliance objectives. And that's some of the stuff that you need to bring into play when you're doing the designs. Okay, and then high is yet another ramp up on that. Now we need to continuously or near continuously monitor the critical functions of the platform. So if somebody tries to use a service that is unauthorized to that user's identity or that service's identity, we need to know about it. If somebody comes knocking on the Telnet ports and we've turned Telnet off, somebody needs to know that soon. That's what continuous monitoring is about in industrial base. Um, Policy-based risk Right? So we have certain process or processes that are more critical to the operation of the platform or the operation to the environment than others. You know, if you're, if you're a temperature sensor, knowing that the sensor is good is good. But knowing that the sensor is accurate is more important. So again, knowing what the function set that you're trying to protect and how you're trying to protect it becomes more critical the higher up the severity level you go in terms of what is the threat. If the threat is, if somebody changes the temperature value on a perfectly good sensor through either an interdiction or even a code manipulation of that device, and that is downstream affecting things like mixing or um, flashpoint levels, these are things that are absolutely critical. And again, I probably don't need to tell anybody in this room, but one of the reasons why IT is different than OT is because the OT the operational technology constructs actually impact human life. They're more like DOD. They're not like the IT brethren that say loss is loss of financial stature, loss of reputation, loss of finance, right? Those are the things that the IT world worries about. The OT world actually considers them differently in the risk model. It's loss of life. It's loss of productivity, because those are the things that are critical to the operational technologies environments. So when we think about this from an OT perspective, the risk becomes more important 
to be able to classify correctly and address correctly. So again, at, at the level uh, SL4, uh, continuous monitoring is a, is a higher level priority now. Um, configuration uh, controls in terms of the application. There was a whole uh, section from ABB in our presentation yesterday about application performance monitoring and management. That's knowing that your application is doing the thing that it's supposed to be doing and not doing what it's not supposed to be doing. Because if you're gonna rely on the data that that is gonna generate in order to adjust your environment in an industrial process, it's pretty critical that that data is known good. It's even more critical that it's demonstrably good. Because just knowing a thing is gonna get you into trouble. You need some means to convey that trust. And what you know, most of the industry has, has tumbled upon and all that is, is that cryptography is a good way to do that. Um, and then last but not least, but it's all about that monitoring function, right? So, you know, in the, in the IT world, we've got this wonderful world of SIMs, right? And, and security information and event management platforms that really don't have a super relevant play in OT yet, right? We've got Splunk here, we've got uh, any number of other vendors that are now bringing their, their IT constructs with OT threat information into the OT modeling. So those SIM type technologies where we have near real time reporting and response pre-programmed on a set of rules. Those are the kind of things that we need to build into the framework when we're talking about SL4 or FISMA high. Okay, moving on. All right, so these are the kinds of standards that are based in here. Again, this is how IIC and the Endpoint Security Best Practices document references back to the contributing elements of industry and government level controls. 62443, IEC, uh, ISO IEC 62443 is an industry construct. It has input from government, but it is not a government standard. It's an industry standard versus FISMA, which is federal law in the US. And there are comparable mechanisms in other countries. So that those folks have to achieve those types of control objectives demonstrably in order to meet their control objectives to protect the public interest. And that's how government gets involved in those environments. So again, 62443, 62623, um, the whole concept around taking something um, out, in the, uh, out in the real application world of something like um, NERC, FERC, and, and the SIP requirements, where you know, those of you that are in the electrical industry probably have a very good working knowledge about how to apply those types of control objectives to your operating environments. And it's everything from monitoring to managing to having security elements to being able to report correctly and then to have a knowledge that the value of the underlying data is good in some demonstrable fashion. That's what NERC does with the SIP infrastructures. All right, so we've, we've talked about a lot um, in a fairly short period of time. The question that always comes up when I talk about this kind of stuff is, you know, Dean, that's great, but can you really do it? Is it really possible to attain these kinds of things? Or are you still going to be in that category of, I really can't do this, right? So I have to accept the risk because there's no way that I can solve for this group of problems. The short answer is yes, there is technologies from my company and others that will allow you to achieve those high levels of certification and those high levels of secure elements associated with those platforms so that A, they are trustworthy. B, they can convey that trust in a format that can be consumed easily. And C, that once consumed, the data that is generated is known to be trustworthy and therefore decision processes that are associated with the data or based on the data are now good. Because at the end of the day, it's garbage in, garbage out, folks. If you can't trust the device that generated the data, I don't care what else you do in the environment. If the data is no good, you're going to make a bad decision or potentially make a bad decision. So we got to get back to the, to the core of the problem. Are we generating good data? Is that thermometer actually accurately reporting the temperature? Don't know. And that's everything from a Nest system sitting in your house to, you know, uh, an industrial temperature gauge sitting in a, in a, in a volatile mix of chemicals in a chemical factory. 
Those are the kinds of things where we need to know that the data is good. You know, if you come home and you live in the, in the Northeast or the Midwest in the middle of winter and your pipes are frozen, you got a problem. But your thermostat said temperature was 68. How could this be? Well, guess what? Thermostat doesn't have a root of trust in most cases. There are a few of them out there that do. Thermostat may have been manipulated by party or parties unknown who may have done it covertly, may have done it overtly, or may not have even known what they were doing because it's just a Nest interface at the end of the day. So these are the kinds of things that we've got to bring to bear when we start thinking about what type of security and what style of security and how much security we need to apply to the platform against the threat. The threat of your pipes bursting can be a fairly expensive event in home ownership, right? Go the other way, be in the south and you've got pets at home and you have air conditioning coming on because otherwise the pets overheat. If the thermostat again is manipulated and the temperature of the house goes to 120 or 130, your pets aren't going to be very happy if they're even still there to greet you. So those are the kinds of things that we got to be talking about. You can take the data element, the data serenity and the, and the data integrity values all the way out to just about any point you can think about, which again is why there's a broad classification that anything that has a network capacity and a computational capability, something that is a computer or has a computer-like process in the case of microcode on an embedded system. These are things that we need to know that they're operating correctly. They're operating as designed. They're within their standard deviations. If we don't have that knowledge, we can't make good decisions at the end of the day. So this particular platform we did with a, 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 a bevy of industry, including uh, Infineon, Avnet, uh, Xilinx. This is an Ultrascale Plus. Um, they, we put the Microsoft Azure agent in the software stack, and Mokana was the security software on the platform. Uh, we actually built this platform and took it through a pseudo evaluation. We didn't actually pay to have ISA Secure come in and do a 62443 evaluation on the platform because it was a test. But we did a pseudo evaluation based on internal reference of what the control objectives would look like in that environment. And we achieved at the platform level, at the 3-3 level and the overlap into 4-2, maybe even a little 4-1, that we achieved that level of security on a computational platform with a whole slew of network capability. This device has nine interfaces on it, ranging from Wi-Fi and WiMAX to uh, real-time networking to LAN to WAN technologies. It's a totally configurable test platform. It's a dev platform that was put together by Avnet for specifically this purpose. We added in an Infineon TPM. We loaded our software stack into Peta Linux. We compiled into the target environment. We configured it based on the information that was available to us as to how the platform and processor were configured, and then we went at it. And we went at it to see if we could generate those, those, that evidence and artifacts of what was in the platform in order to be able to say, yes, we can actually get to 62443 3-3 SL4 on a platform that looks a lot like this. Or yes, we can actually get to FISMA High, which in the government space is generally reserved for government-owned systems built for purpose. Right? You don't find too many COTS platforms in the government that are achieving FISMA High. And there's things above FISMA High, right, in the U.S. government space anyway. So anyway, the benefits of all this were we achieved all the control objectives that were required. So what I'm here to tell you is, yes, we can build in an industrial setting, these types of control architectures. Yes, we can actually achieve the compliance objectives that are at the end of the string, right? I, again, I'm not advocating for building for compliance purposes. I'm saying build for security purposes and get compliance as a result. Okay, moving on. So implementing these, again, finding what your threat profile is, and taking the required or requisite elements associated with that level and start thinking about how to implement them. That's what my company does. We build the architectures and the cryptographic frameworks to make these platforms work. The, the endpoint security best practices is public. Uh, if you just Google 
or come by our booth, we'll give you a copy. Uh, it's IIC Endpoint Security Best Practices or ESBP and it'll pop up as the first or second hit on Google. It's a free download, it's 13 pages including the cover sheet and the final page which is blank. 11 pages of text and figures. And again, it's designed to get your arms wrapped around when do you need basic, when do you need enhanced, when do you need critical. Um, what do I have until three, right? Okay, so I got about another 10 minutes here. Um, I'm gonna buzz through these pretty quick. These are the concepts behind each one of those elements. So in all three, there is the concept of a root of trust in low, medium, and high, in 6443, SL23, and four. There is a requirement for some form of root of trust, some place to start your measurements from that is trustworthy. In, in two, again, that could be a software-based root of trust. In three, that's required to be a firmware-based root of trust, like a TE trust zone, or an Intel EPID using the SDO process where Intel is independently verifying that the device is exactly what it purports to be and then issuing it an ID that is associated with that configuration and device. Those are the kinds of things that we can do today. Um, if you've been following the news, uh, ARM just announced a partnership with Intel, which is kind of novel ground <laughs> um, since they've been fierce competitors for a very long time. But they announced a partnership with Intel where ARM technologies are now going to use the Intel EPID SDO process because ARM has a hard time identifying their platforms. They've got the TE Trust Zone construct, but how do you know it's the right one? How do you know that it's configured right? How do you know that the rest of the platform is going to operate as designed and built? The Trust Zone can enable that but without device identity, strong device identity, based on some level of third-party evaluation of the device, you can't get there. So the, the industries that we all rely on for everything from memory to compute to platform to operations are all being built with these concepts in mind because that's what's necessary to secure the environments. All right, so root of trust is, is important. We're, if you look at 863, which is all about identity proofing, there are basically three levels of identity proofing according to NIST. Each one of them has a very specific role to play. Each one of them has a very specific set of security processes associated with how do you develop identity, how do you derive identity, how do you validate identity, how do you share identity. 863 is all about what a secure identity mechanism looks like. And again, 853 and FISMA reference 863 when it comes to identity. What level of proof do you need that you are who you say you are? You know, I can say I'm you know, Bill Gates. Do I look like Bill Gates? No. Do I sound like Bill Gates? No. But I can say whoever I want. I can even take a picture and put it on my badge. If that's the level of security that you need, self-attestation, self-signed, self-attested to, fine. I'm Bill Gates. How do you do? If you need something stronger than that, because you need to base your decision logic on stronger identity, then you need to go up the stack some, right? Now I need some biometric that proves that I'm Bill Gates or not. So again, these are all concepts of how you build security into those frameworks. Um, examples of a root of trust. TPM is probably the, the best known hardware root of trust. There are other forms of roots of trust. Um, NXP Secure Elements, uh, Intel EPID SDO, uh, Jamalto eSIM, an HSM, a CA, a MIM, all of those kinds of functions are able to provide a root of trust measurement and validation that says, I'm not Bill Gates, I'm Dean Weber. I can prove that I'm Dean Weber. I can't prove that I'm Bill Gates. Okay, um, again, back to the identity piece. RFC 7030 is the resolve for why certificate management's actually gonna work in an industrial environment. 
Uh, those of you that have worked with certificates and run into that marvelous little brick wall called SCEP, um, there is a industry resolve to that problem. It was codified in RFC 7030. It's called Enrollment Over Secure Transport. It allows us to do SCEP-like enrollment and certificate management on devices over the wire or over the air with the same or greater level of efficacy that you would get out of SCEP without having the fundamental downfalls of SCEP, which is the SCEP process itself is insecure. So you have to do it in a secure environment. You have to either bring the device that you want to identify to a secure enclave running SCEP, or you have to take a secure SCEP instance out to the device, which isn't necessarily easy in industrial environments. So again, a lot of the things that traditionally have been hard to do are starting to become much less hard as our industry and our design precepts are being challenged by how do we do these things today? How do we do certificate management on distributed platforms? And the answer is RFC 7030, Enrollment Over Secure Transport. Um, secure boot. I'm sure everybody's got some concept of secure boot. I could probably ask 10 people and get 10 different descriptions of what secure boot actually is because there is not a standard yet around secure boot. But believe me, it's coming, right? So the concept of boot architectures, there's actually four basics. There's unsecured or untrusted boot. There is secured or trusted boot as the first stage. That means that the image that is currently running is the image that was loaded when we, when we booted it. I can't tell you if it changed at all, but I can tell you that it was the image that was supposed to load when we loaded it. That's what secure boot does. And it includes BIOS and first and second stage and third stage if there is one bootloaders. It includes some level of measurement associated with kernel or utilities or virtualization. All of these things are possible today in secure boot. But at the end of the day, I can't tell you if something goes wrong once booted. I can only measure at boot, which brings us to measured boot, which is the next stage in this patch. And you'll see it as we go up the stack here. That measured boot construct is all about how do I know that something changed since I booted a secure object or a secure environment? I still can't fix it yet other than to reboot the image, but at least I know that some element has changed inside the environment. And then when you get to the third stage of that, a stage that we're calling protected boot, protected boot gives you the ability to say, it was this application and its value changed. It's no longer hashing at the same value that I expected it to hash at. Something changed in that application. Code, configuration, modeling, interface, something changed. Now, my choice is because I know it's that element and I have a local replacement element in the protected boot architecture, I can replace that element. That's where we're headed, folks. We're not there today. Cryptographic services. Um, you know, I could spend all day on cryptographic services. Let's suffice it to say that when we think about cryptographic services, you know, the, the, the big uh, two-sided coin there is whether you're talking about open source security or whether you're talking about commercial security. And there's pros and cons of both. Obviously, commercial security costs money. Open source community is included in the operating platform, open SSM, SSL, embed TLS, those types of structures. But you get what you pay for. They're not free. They're hard to manage. They're easy to use self-signed certificates on. They're hard to use a certificate authority to provision multiple tiers inside something like OpenSSL or Embed TLS. It's much easier to do in a commercial environment that was built to do those kinds of things. So there's always a trade-off there in terms of what is the value proposition of open source security versus what is the, the value of, of closed source security or, or commercial security. And then there's halfway points like Mocana, because we actually deliver our cryptographic services as source code to be reviewed and compiled by the target. That means you can see everything that the code's going to do when it's compiled. You have control over the compiler. You have control and validation via the compiler reports. All of those things are in your control. So it's some of the value of open source and some of the value of closed commercial. It's a halfway point in between. And there's others besides us that are doing that, don't get me wrong. Um, Lots of standards that are coming to play, right? Most of your CAs, HSMs, are now using PKCS standards. Uh, that's a good thing because that standardizes a communications interface between the identity source or validator 
and the identity usage in an environment. Um, there's others. FIPS is another good standard to go by. Uh, FIPS is a federal information processing standard, specifically to cryptographic services. It's 140-2. There's four levels. Level one, which is software only, which is what Mokana does because we're software. Levels two, three, and four require hardware interfaces. Level four is the equivalent of a U.S. government type one encryptor. It's a sealed encrypted in encryptment, encryption environment. There is no cryptographic code running. It's a hardware function and everything in between. So that's what FIPS does is it validates that against all front and back channel attacks as well as all known defined side channel attacks to include some of the things that you've heard about so far this week. So FIPS is testing for those types of uh, vulnerabilities in the cryptographic code structures and their roots of trust. Secure communications, that's the transport. How do I convey that level of trust from one point to another? It's applicable to all three levels. Um, SSL might be a good way to do, uh, you know, transport at, at SL2 or at FIS Malo. You might have to go to IPsec and a full exchange function with a full validation function without interpretation that is IPsec. And you might have to use Ike V2 with all the new key entropy and um, key padding structures that NIST has proposed as a pre post quantum half step. So again, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish, what those transport protocols, just be aware that comms are part of the standard, they're parts of the stack. Uh, we'll leave that one alone. Again, I think the slides are going to be made available so we can, come, we, we can have further conversations about any of these. I want to leave a couple of minutes for Q&A. Um, at the end of the day, companies like Mokana can help you achieve these functions. We work with the standards organizations, we work with the developmental organizations, we work with many of you already to where we build cryptographic services that are known and validated and we provide trust mechanisms that can be developed and built in and therefore leveraged and trustworthy in how to build trustworthy platforms in order to achieve trustworthy data and then how to convey that trustworthy data. And with that, I'll open it up for questions, if there are any, or if I should just shut up and sit down. A lot of information. Our booth's right across the street over here. Uh, feel free to stop by. I'll be here through tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we've got a whole team of people here that are quite capable. Right. Thanks all for listening.